Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for September 26, 2022. I'm your host, Jeanette Dobheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about us can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is lowering, lowering the barrier to entry for regulated research through community building. Our presenters are Carolyn Ellis and Eric Dimmons. Uh, Carolyn is the CMMC program manager at UC California, at University of California, San Diego, where she builds and leads sustainable regulated research programs. Eric is the full-time director of the Department of Research Computing at University of Florida Information Technology. Yep at the University of Florida with experience in FISMA 853 and CUI 800-171. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. And we are planning on having questions or time for questions at the end of the presentation as well. With that, I'll hand things over to Carolyn. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you. Um, that one. Uh, thank you so much for having us, first of all. Um, I really appreciate this, and we've really appreciated our partnership and collaborations with Trusted CI. So this is a very valuable uh, venue to us. To set the agenda a little bit of what you'll be hearing about, essentially it's the what who when all of that component so what are we who are we as RCOP and we'll actually we'll start even with what is RCOP but then we'll talk about some of the ways that we've engaged other groups and how we're um, working toward our mission too and then we'll hit on a little bit of what's coming in the future as well as how to join and as yes as mentioned we will have some time for questions, so come up with some interesting ones. We, we love some curved balls. First one to dive into what is RCOP. And so I put at the bottom RCOP, we pronounce it R, R well, it's RRCOP, but that does not roll off anyone's tongue. And so it's RCOP, and that stands for Regulated Research Community of Practice. And while I will go through the components that began with that, because this truly did start in de December, well, last December, so 10 months ago. But I also wanted to mention that life didn't just begin 10 months ago either for this. And so the current award is titled Building a Community of Practice for Supporting Regulated Research. And this is an NSF funded award for three years. And as I mentioned, it started in December. And Eric and I are the two leaders, leaders of this. And the reason we are doing this, and at least what we said that our broader impact would be, is um, to increase the ability of all institutions um, to get into regulated research, whether it's bringing on a new regulation, whether it's starting from scratch, all of that, as well as some of the smaller institutions we know have a much harder time jumping into this. And that's due to, well, how many dedicated staff do you require? How many new expertise do you need to grow? All of that. And then the individual institutions, obviously, you can now support a, a whole lot more without growing that in in-house expertise. But where I mentioned, like I go back to that first point that I put as we didn't just start 10 months ago was we truly did start informally, I'd say in 2018 when PERC offered a four hour workshop on regulated research. And this became truly novel in that time where this was an opportunity to come together and actually talk with each other about the problems that we were all seeing in our own institutions running these programs and 
yeah, essentially it was, it was something new that we hadn't experienced before. And now that I'm a slide into things, I also recognize I truly haven't defined regulated research yet. So to us, regulated research is any form of research that is um, in, in a alignment with various uh, government controls or compliance regulations. And this could be in the healthcare space, you might be talking HIPAA, you might be talking export controlled, so that would be ITAR, or you might be talking um, Department of Defense, so the FAR clauses, um, all of those items that fit into, it's not our fundamental research. Um, I suppose that goes, in, goes decent into what our history was, but shortly after that, we set up a Slack site to continue these conversations. And while it started as pretty quiet and just the people presenting, it has turned into, this morning we checked over 750 people in it. So we will share those links at the end on how to join if you're not already there, but we highly encourage if regulated research is in any capacity part of your job to join. There are people like you out there. That brings me to who are we? And I chose this image to represent us because it's a really important image to us. This is, we are the collection of all of our participants and people helping bring information to the forefront and share knowledge that they've probably worked hard to acquire. So in answer to that, we are research institutions that support um, we support research subject to compliance regulations, and we're working together to grow the knowledge pool and produce efficiencies. Um, this picture has around 170 different institutions. We have Alaska and Hawaii are definitely here too, but they're not shown due to scale. Um, but we have every single state except for Wyoming right now. So if you know any Wyoming people or if there's any on the call, hey, we're looking to, for you to join. That would be a great <clears throat> metric. Uh, we also do have some representation from Canada and Australia, which originally surprised me, but then I recognized that they have items that are covered under various control sets too. And so it's not always just US regulations. It could be a variety of either local ordinances or, um, well, international ones, maybe GDPR, things like that. Yes, yeah, so uh, what are we trying to do and why do we think a community of practice is, the, is a good way to attack it? <clears throat> and the thing is, the problem is quite complicated and it is not easily cast into a single box where you say, okay, I'll just take this YouTube video and I'll learn how to deal with it. It, it requires a lot of complexity and that is given as a result of the way these compliance requirements are formulated. They typically come in long lists of things thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that. <clears throat> and these activities are not all of a purely technical nature, although some of the ones that require some significant attention and even investment in terms of particular hardware or software are technical, which is why often when administrators are confronted with regulated research requirements, they immediately turn to the IT infrastructure and the CIO and ask the CIO to then implement a compliance mechanism. <laughs> but IT people are not the only ones that need to be involved. There's privacy people, there's legal activities, there's training activities, and there is also contract administration and and negotiation that's involved. So the Office of Research is often involved. And that's what makes this quite complicated. And so if a small institution says, okay, we wanna 
go into the area of supporting regulated research. Then they hire a person, and now that one person has to take care of all these activities, establish all these connections across the campus to try and make this work. <clears throat> and that is where a community of practice really helps. There are some people who were put in this position, and then over the years, they've developed ways of dealing with it, and they have now generously shared some of that information, which we make available on our website. And so the community of practice basically gives us a place where if you are given this mandate, get a compliance program going at our campus, then you can join our community and there will be people who are just like you, a little bit ahead of you in experience and along the path and some who have been there for years and all of them are really very happy to have a conversation with you and answer your questions and that's also what the slack channel has proven a, a lot <clears throat> a lot of value in the second thing is that we started hipaa is from 1997 but what happened in the last five years is that all of a sudden this whole atmosphere around regulation has dramatically increased it has grown uh, maybe not exponentially but definitely massively and then 2021 was definitely sort of a year of reckoning because that's when basically some ransomware attack or other bad event at some academic institution was in the news, there was almost something every week. <laughs> and that meant that the administrators at different institutions all of a sudden took note and say, ooh, maybe we need to do something. And a lot of more activity uh, was created at each of the institutions, but also federally and nationally, and even with companies that universities may have contracts with, are, being, are, are now requiring that you take care of their data in some more specific way and that you prove that you're actually doing it. So that is where you uh, have all of a sudden a very useful role for a community of practice so that we are in it all together and you're not just on your own making the same mistakes that others have made uh, and you know you can move much faster because the world requires you to move faster next slide please so the goals of our project <clears throat> are listed briefly here the first one i already talked about is we we want to build a community because that's very helpful and what is the value of this community it is that you can have resources resources in the sense of videos that people have created documents, templates, and also just other people who will are willing to share, who are willing to explain things to you. We have a webinar series where people talk about their experience, and then it's just like a training session. And in addition, people are willing to sort of get into a little bit more personal or detailed relationship with you and play a mentor with you. Uh, that's all organically growing, but so far it has helped. It has helped me. Uh, when I started this uh, since 2015, and so it, it does help to have these resources and we collect them all in our website. Then the second thing is, <clears throat> as a community, we are much more likely to be able to get a voice with those who are creating these requirements. And so one of the things that, that is on everybody's mind right now is CMMC, the, cyber, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Program that the DOD has been working on for the last couple of years. Well, they have an academic advisory council and one of the people who is a member of our community is on that council and so, that gives us a voice to, to say, hey, this particular control is very hard to implement for an academic institution. It's not the same as a business or uh, what you originally thought about. And that is something that an individual institution 
is going to be likely unsuccessful in trying to negotiate with a program officer, hey, we don't want to do this or we cannot do this, this is very hard. The program officer has a mandate and they you know, cannot really act upon it. But if you have this voice as a community to talk to when to the high level leadership and that create these documents, then uh, we have a bigger chance. Another partner that we have is the High Trust Alliance, which is a highly regarded uh, standards organization in the more focused on the healthcare. Uh, but they are now also working on CMMC because they are just a standards security organization. And we have a close partnership with them. And so again, uh, we're working on various ways to sort of make sure that they understand our pain points and then hopefully document, either change the requirements or tell us how can we meet them in a proper way so that when you get an audit, the auditor will actually appreciate, yes, that is an accepted way of dealing with this particular control. Another thing that the, the community is useful for is if you're a single person and you have way more on your plate than is manageable in a 24 hour day, then having a community where we have all these eyes and ears, many of us can, not, not everybody can attend every webinar, but many of us can, and then we share the information. And then in the end is also once we figure out something, we can share and say, hey, I figured out how to do this and my auditors uh, liked it. Next slide, please. So this is where I already talked about a little bit. We have some partners and we have them divided into three categories, like Trusted CI is one partner, Internet2, uh, Roswell Park uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. We call them resource partners. They are helping us uh, provide resource, share them. Another one is integration partners, EDUCOS, High Trust, and the CMMC Advisory, Academic Advisory Council. They are the people who have a strong voice and are interested in creating uh, and improving how the regulation actually gets written. And then we have a specific domain. There was a, a grant that's a predecessor to the current grant uh, that was led by Purdue, and they created all kinds of documents which uh, in the last month were put on our website. They're, you can find them, they're very useful to help. So this is the, the whole point is that compliance comes in many forms and we cannot have everybody by themselves is not likely to be able to drive the change. But if as a community, we hope we can do that. And, and so far, we are at least having many positive conversations so that we are really moving in, in this direction. And so far, it looks like it's working and there is value to being part of this community. So this way, if you have a concern, bring it up at many of our discussion sessions. And uh, either we already have an answer or we can bring it up through these partnerships and, and hopefully sort of help determine our future. Next slide. All right, I'll take this one in terms of when we were trying to figure things out of what was what was our place in this, this market that has so many different um, voices. And what we were also recognizing was people were talking about regulated research from a very, um, well, limited perspective. So for example, people are gathering around the country in various meetings, all talking about how it impacts them and their role. And we were recognizing that there was no um, glue holding all of those groups together. And so instead of replacing any of the various communities or um, overtaking anything in that space, we, we discovered that we fit really well as the glue in between quite a few different communities. And we recognized that there was no group that spanned end to end through all of these various impacted domains. And the domains in my head were the government relations who's sitting at that table, the research administration, those would be your export control, your IRB, uh, those offices, your training and outreach, the cyber infrastructure ecosystem. So many of your system admin, 
type roles and then your data security roles. And our answer to that is, here's the same diagram with various <laughs> groups that are all aligned communities in our opinion. Um, and they're likely at attending their various meetings, uh, working through a component of the regulated research full work workspace. And to us, our biggest value is by connecting some of those conversations that, so for example, FDP, I can, I highly doubt many of us on the trusted CI call would be from that community and that's federal demonstration partnerships. They work with uh, federal agencies side by side, and they work through. Here's a process that maybe this is a maybe this is a better way that we could, I don't know, bring in contract data that contains these clauses. So they are out there working. So other ones you may may or may not have heard of. AU Echo is Association of um, Export Control Officers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Coger um, Council on Government Relations, and that's uh, a bit of higher ed's voice back to the government. And by merging some of these items where we're more comfortable in the Bren ISAC, Trusted CI, or even getting into the CASC space where that's um, what is it, the Coalition of Academic um, Scientific Computing. Thank you. <laughs> um, so some of these communities, maybe we've will will speak at, or s someone in these various communities can share information back. But this is a a great way of taking all of these roles associated with everything that happens through our entire workflows of regulated research and bringing them a location to share information at. Yeah. So one of the products of our collaboration so far is <clears throat> our workshop series. And so we created uh, six mini collaborative workshops actually that preceded this particular award, but it was very instrumental in formulating the actual proposal and recognizing the need. And that resulted in a report that is available on our website that gives a very good guidance and overview. So if you're beginning, go and read that report. It is worth your, your while. And it has input from a lot of people, which I think is why it, it is so resonates with, with what everything uh, people may run into uh, because there were voices, part of these workshops that told us their concerns and they've been incorporated in the, in the final document. So there are six mo sort of pillars of, of the program that you need to work on when you're trying to create something at your institution. You have to first define ownership, roles, and responsibilities. You have to come up with cost analysis and a financial impact because people will always ask you about that. Then you have to build and maintain a training program because that is crucial as part of the compliance. The end user is always a crucial part of it. It's not just a technical thing. Then you have to have a cohesive approach to audit and assessment. You have to find some way that is affordable that you can show to your contractors that yes, we are doing this. And then there is an, an important, there's a little bit more delicate and complicated sometimes. Sometimes it's straightforward, is the interpretation and guidance on the controls. But that is where, especially when you're just beginning, uh, the guidance of peers is very helpful, where you can have a conversation like, I'm trying to implement this control this way. Will that work? And will it meet uh, scrutiny from an auditor? And then finally, the very important part is scoping the security boundary. Because if you, if you do that incorrectly and you bite off too much, then you're never going to get it done. If you bite off too little, then the auditors are going to say, oh, no, no, you need to include this other thing. Next slide, please. So several of the things that we are 
delivering with this project now, all inspired by this uh, workshop series and their report, we want to have a community of peers around compliance. And that is different from just doing research, although we have to have researchers because we need to understand if you're going to implement a set of compliance rules, you don't want to have them be so restrictive that people cannot carry out their research anymore. So that's, a, that's an important part. And then <clears throat> we want to be able to have all the other people involved, contract administrators and everybody else. So what are the deliverables that the community brings? You can ask and get answers to questions. And if you are an active participant, then you'll be one of the ones who can give answers. We have uh, monthly webinars. We share white papers, documentation, and templates. We have the video recordings of the webinars. Many of the webinars are centered around a very specific topic and are really like a YouTube training video, many of them. And then uh, we have now a community where we can uh, establish mentoring and networking relationships. So um, some of the community activities are we plan meetings. And when we have these webinars, we have a, a Google sheet where people can put in ideas. Sometimes we have definitely discussion sessions where we ask people for input on a certain topic. And then one of the things that we still are gearing up to do is we want to create some working groups. We've sort of covered the easy things and, and gathered information, have shown examples of, of how to do and how some things are done at some institutions so people can see this is all inspiring. And from that, we've identified that there are some things that are a little bit more complicated than a single webinar will address. And so we are now going to establish a group of working, a, a set of working groups. And we hope that uh, you as a member of the community are willing to volunteer. And one of the rules that we want to put up on these volunteers is often if you are volunteer for something, then there is some pressure to, to sort of keep going. But we want to be very flexible and say, if you please feel free to volunteer and say, hey, I can volunteer and collaborate and work for the next couple of weeks uh, or a couple of months. But if all of a sudden something comes up and say, oh, something happened, I cannot work on this anymore, then we would want you to feel totally free to say, hey, I can't work on this anymore. I'm going to be offline for forever or, or for a while and then later come back. We don't want this to be a big commitment uh, because we feel that that might uh, sort of be a deterrent to be a, a volunteer. And we want lots of people to volunteer, contribute what they can, and then feel free to do other things that their jobs and life asks for. Next slide, please. I'll hop on on this one where one of the things that we pulled together early, this was even early in December range, we started bringing together a public website and it's been growing a lot since its first creation, uh, but you'll find that our website is regulatedresearch.org. And through this, I am a big, big, like my entire uh, professional existence has essentially been collect a whole lot of information and find ways to share it out, whether it's uh, wikis, whether it's this public website, but if there's things that I have found that have been fascinating or gosh, I wish I had access to that later, that's what I'm pulling together. And that's what our website is, is really um, well supplied with. So you'll, you'll even find that all of the trusted CI websites or um, webinars that have been produced on related topics within regulated research, we're linking right back to them. Let's make sure you have access to all of those different communities. What are they talking about? What are they producing? And how can we share that information better with each other, whether it's higher ed uh, templates. Um, I've even found that uh, the Air Force had a small portion of uh, funds set aside to, to make a CUI training site. So they now, 
uh, that's that bottom image with all the words, but it's essentially um, really solid government made um, material that can help you out depending on where in the journey you are. And maybe you don't need much of the what's on the website yet, but maybe you need small portions of it. We also link out to official documents because I think nothing irritates me more than searching anything with the word CMMC in it. And I get a page and a half of ads and yeah, I can clearly see there are people out making money, making money on the confusion that's out there. And in higher ed, well, we're kind of trying to scrape through all of that, trying to figure out what's verified or trusted in this space. And at this moment, we're trying to provide that information back to you. So we're also always looking for, hey, Carolyn, did you know about this? please put it on our website. We just produced this, for example, in um, an 800-171 community group led by Educause. They just made a toolkit. Okay, that's definitely something that needs to go on our website. So just trying to create links back to where people are talking about the things that we care about. As as Eric did mention, we do host monthly webinars. It's the second Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific time zone or 2 p.m. Eastern time zone. And we tried going with six different rotating types of flavors. And we have some that are in, um, established institutions and telling their story of what they've um, maybe been through or worked through recently, but then we also want to showcase some of the emerging institutions and where that one's a fascinating one is they're the, they're the group that we're really here for. They are the group that I'm trying to bring on this new regulation and here's what I'm struggling with. And this is where the community can come back and say, we can help you with this. Uh, we certainly have research focused ones on how can you really engage your researchers. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, training topics and then baseline metrics, planning. We've done a few different planning meetings. Our first one was actually with Trusted CI last year at the Cybersecurity Summit. And we've repeated that in a few different ways and gotten some different votes and more input, but I wanted to share some a little bit about what we have done in terms of our webinars. We've hosted one every single month since January. And uh, so for example, the top one is financials and cost models. That one is two different institutions with nearly a decade of lessons hard learned within their cost models. And that one's a really popular one. We, we also have voices from the aligned communities. So for example, we had six different aligned communities that we saw in the pillar diagram and they just shared what's going on in their space. And maybe they, they were bringing a new perspective that we hadn't even realized. Um, we even had the CMMC Academic Advisory Council come speak to us on that one. Uh, future ones, th that's going along with the planning. We have asked about various topics that people are interested in. We're trying to make sure we hear the stories from those of us who maybe have a very similar environment, or maybe they have a completely different way of thinking about it. And I think putting those stories out there really helps the whole community because it gives you those contacts of well, they tried something different and it, it worked or it didn't. Let, let's talk about that part. So going forward, <laughs> we see two, two things uh, that we should pay attention to. We work for the community. That means sort of inward facing. We have identified and we have already worked on some initial issues, but now some bigger issues need to be addressed. And that's where, as I was saying, we were trying to look for working groups and workshops. So we're looking for volunteers and we wanna make sure that we avoid burnout of volunteers, that we get lots of people help a little bit and then you know, pass on the torch to somebody else. <clears throat> 
some of the topics that we are interested in that we have already identified and that we need more work on is gathering examples from experience and then document and build templates uh, from lessons learned. So we already have some documentation, but the templates is something that's uh, still in the works. And then with the community outward facing, we want to work through our partners to shape the compliance landscape uh, so that it becomes doable and maintainable and sustainable and scalable for academic institutions. And, and some of the partners are the High Trust Alliance. There's a NIST working group that is working on creating a special publication specifically dedicated to HPC, calling out those controls that are inspired by desktop machines and make sense for desktop machines, but they make absolutely no sense for high performance computing systems, like daily scanning of all the files of your multi petabyte file system is not something that works and will finish in a reasonable day and actually add any value. But that's not what the control says. The control says you have to have antivirus working <coughs> and working with the CMMC. Next slide, please. So here, uh, we basically invite you to join us. And, and the Higher Ed CUI is a Slack group that we have, and it now has over 750 uh, members. And it's, uh, it's an active, it has multiple channels, and you can ask a question, and there will be somebody who will answer uh, with a detailed answer or a link or whatever. And it's very helpful, and if you scan, this barcode, then you can uh, join. And then our website is regulatedresearch.org, where it has lots and lots of information and also a page where you can sign up to get the email address uh, or to be added to the email list. And the list is where we announce our monthly webinars and other activities. And then uh, here are some email addresses that you can reach out to either for general questions or to us personally. Thank you. Um, we have a question coming in here. Uh, when you mentioned doing NIST 800 publication, is it strictly related to 853 or are you looking at 800-171 also? So what we're trying to create is a, a guidance document that will refer to or, or uh, yeah, refer to and be based on the control catalog 853. You have to realize that 800-171 is a um, tailoring of 53. It basically said, look, we take the 53 moderate controls and we focus on the ones that handle confidentiality because we assume that every organization that is sufficiently mature uh, already knows how to deal with integrity and availability and so we don't specify that as in in an as detailed way so the the question is really 171 is a subset of 53 and what we're can what we're looking at is to cover the whole thing and we will create uh hopefully an overlay, which is basically addressing each of the controls. And the bigger set is the 53 set, uh, and will provide guidance on how to implement them for an HPC system. That's the sort of design goal of this group. Thank you. Um... Do we have more to, to cover before I start um, pinging the group for more questions? We don't, ping away. All right, so um, I'm just gonna throw up um, a slide to give people time to chat, uh, type. Um, one second, let's pull this up. Okay, so now is kind of the time for open questions. This is where you bring your concerns to Carolyn and Eric. Um, our next webinar is going to be Monday, December 5th. I have a topic. I'm just 
it had we're waiting on a speaker to confirm so i don't want to release it to the public just yet but it's coming so just uh be on the lookout for notifications from me about that also our summit's coming up october 18th through 20th in bloomington indiana and if you want to register for that uh, go to trustedci.org 2022-cybersecurity summit um, and uh, for those of you who are going to sc if you haven't um, registered for that i think it's probably closed by now but it's coming up in november um, november 13th through 18th in dallas so um, you may see members of our community there um so I, have, I, have, I have one that i could come up with then of one of the i i did say that we we deal with mostly the on the regulated research side but one of the interesting blurry lines recently is NSPM 33 that comes in um, pretty much changing our fundamental research of if you get over $50 million of research, you must have a cybersecurity program. And that cybersecurity program of what they lay out looks a lot like CMMC level one and those controls. And I think that's an interesting one on how what was fundamental is slowly starting to turn into there are some regulations that will or at least compliance controls that will be in place moving forward on that so i think that's an interesting area of how it comes into our space and we are willing to pay some attention to it at this time because well it's likely going to be us that us as a community that bring forward these components into our institution. What's the saying? Um, so thereby goes California, so goes the rest of the country or some, something like that, right? <laughs> okay, so um, those of you in the audience, do you have any questions or comments for um, Carolyn and Eric? Um, do you, are, you, are you struggling with a program? Do you need assistance? <laughs> what can we do to support you? Well, I, I think everybody's pretty satisfied with their programs, I guess. I, I, I think the next <laughs> step then is uh, please join the Slack. I just posted a link here. Um, to the um, the RCOP Slack, and just note that the naming standard includes uh, first name, last name, and institution. So please uh, go ahead and join that. You said it, there was over seven hundred uh, subscribers, so that's a lot of people who are helping each other out, which is great. We someone raised their hand. Um, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna attempt to allow this person to talk. So. We're, we're trying this the first time on Trusted CI's webinar history, so hopefully this works. Um, Peter, you you can unmute now. Oh, hi, thanks. I um, actually was hovering my mouse along the bottom there and was gonna hit chat and then it finally let me um, raise my hand. Uh, we're, we're, I'm at Georgia Tech, and we are currently going through trying to come up with an architecture for CMMC. And some of our discussions have uh, wandered into things like, what about infrastructure, like uh, Active Directory, DNS? How are those um, going to be evaluated in a CMMC assessment? And where can we find some guidance on how to harden those kind of things if they are covered by the assessments for CMMC? I'll, I'll take a first stab at this and Eric can fill in where I miss, but my logic there is there's a lot of people asking that exact same question of, I mean, so endpoints are also another key example of how much separation do you need from here is the enclave and then what all gets scoped into that and so to that i i would i do think that examples that we we should provide as a community are going to be something like 
here is potentially a, a control sets that have made it through responses that have made it through an assessment. And so, okay, if, if this group got through with um, using their central campus AD versus this group who purchased a whole nother duplication of all their infrastructure, uh, maybe there is a better ways to be doing this and how did they phrase that? But I recognize too that we can't just be posting all of this stuff on a public website of here's here's what we did, here's how we scoped it. <clears throat> That's a little too much to provide at that big level, but I'd like to be able to provide that of need to know type of information of, okay, let me make sure I've connected you with uh, someone at this institution who's fighting that exact same question and their environment might look similar enough. But Eric, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. There's gonna be a varied experience and, and we would be happy. And that may be one of the functions of, of having a work group so that we can have, when people have more specific questions like you, that you can reach out to a group of people that have offered to talk to people who have questions about it and then maybe have a, a, a session with your team on, on their experience and, and delve into this in, in detail. Because the, the standard question that the DOD guidance is telling, uh, if there is anything that you need that impacts the security of your system, it's in scope. But at a university, that becomes very, very complicated. And it, you know, because then it connects to this and it connects to that and it connects to this. And in the end, you have this completely unwieldy scope creep. And so you have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing we're finding in our architecture group is right. that we could build something that is, will be CMMC compliant. And then, you know, we can make it, if it doesn't, if it's not too costly, we can just use that as the standard campus AD or VPN or whatever. You know, if I have to be FIPS 140-2 compliant in everything, that may not be so bad. But then other things that the assessor may want, we may not be able to fund for the entire campus. Exactly, you know? exactly. So it's very, it's very important. So you... you so this is something where our community can help. I mean, we haven't really set up a big mechanism, but in order to get started, you know, reach out to, to the Slack channel or to one of us and, and we'll get you in touch with some people that can uh, share their experience and, and help you make the decision. But like Carolyn said, this is a very active decision at this point. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the points where we will need some guidance from the CMMC themselves. It's like you, you're saying as the moment it comes in uh, or it contributes to security, it has to be in scope. Well, at a complex institution, uh, like an academic institution, that's not that simple. You need further guidance and maybe have some exceptions or some mitigating controls or some way to, to clarify that. And that is where our membership to the CMMC Academic Advisory Council is, is going to be crucial to steer that direction in a way that is sustainable for us rather than coming up with the final answer, oh, your entire campus is in scope because that surely is not working. <clears throat> right, and in, 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 in my case, I'm managing a regulated uh, high performance cluster. So I am particularly interested in the, the, what you mentioned about the 800 uh, NIST uh, special uh, document regarding HPC. I attended the, the NSF HPC security conference, and so some of those, um, I you know, some of those topics came up, like not being a, not doing file scanning on all two thousand of my nodes on the same five petabyte file system. You know, those kind of things, and I'm having some trouble getting my security team to understand that. Um, maybe we should do the file scanning on a dedicated node that isn't running compute jobs or, you know, high throughput type jobs and impacting user experience, that kind of thing. So that's definitely of interest to me as well. Yep. Yep. I, I 
definitely have resources um, I can connect you with. Yeah, yeah. That, that there, will be, there will be a workshop uh, on the Friday after supercomputing in Dallas uh, to address this, that we're, we're trying to organize a, a panel on, on this uh, this document and this working group that I was talking about. Right. Yeah, I see things like Audit D being recommended by our security team, but I remember somebody at the NSF Security Summit saying that you almost need another HPC system to analyze the logs from such an instrumented HPC <laughs> system. So that's clearly not going to work too well. If you're trying to do real time analysis of an intrusion or something like that, the log entries coming in would just be too uh, too massive to, to process in real time. Yep. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to uh, grab the horn and sh commiserate? <laughs> Great. So um, let's give people a moment to collect their thoughts if they want to raise their hand or something like that. So Eric, again, you're saying there's a webinar at uh, on at the end of supercomputing that's coming up. Yeah. So super, a workshop. Supercomputing uh, sort of ends on the 17th, the official program, mm -hmm. and there is a, on the 18th there are several other associated workshops. Mm -hmm. And so there is one being planned for that day, but I don't have the final details yet. But if you look at the supercomputing website, that's where that'll become available. Great. Okay. Well, those of you who are attending supercomputing, keep an eye out for that. Um, let's wrap things up then. Any, any final comments, um, Carolyn and Eric? No, thank you for listening. And, and, you know, if you're interested, we always are accepting volunteers and, and we'll have some call outs for volunteers for some of our working groups that we're trying to come up with and that the community has asked for tackling some of these bigger issues. I suppose we're also game on any feedback of, oh my gosh, this template saved us so much time or thank you on that because we don't really know where some of our information's hitting, but I'm sure when you need it, it's there for you. Yeah, yeah it's definitely true. good to to know where people are getting the most value out of the resources. Because yeah, then you yeah. could just we, put it up do, higher we on the like, website. We like we do like kudo emails because <laughs> we can report that to our NSF sponsors and say, yeah, people appreciated what we did and what you funded. So. It looks like uh, someone posted um, CMMC, a, a link to CMMC scope. Um, so it's at ACQ. Um, we do have the scoping guide, I believe, um, the parent site linked to on that one. So yes. Yeah. Great. OK, well, thank you so much for uh, presenting today. And uh, oh, wait, we've got one more person who raised their hand, it looks like. Scott. Yes. Good morning. Um, <laughs> I, something I was thinking of that's, I think, somewhat confusing that maybe a collective of us could pursue would be as we engage with various different data providers, the process by which we go to to like, like ask for the data, provide verification or provide documentation, and then thus you know get the the researchers to the point where they have a signed EUA that they can go and get data. It's a little bit um, vague in a lot of the, the data providers. And I just like those, the steps and what's required and what's not required, um, I think would be helpful as we look at things like um, a lot of us get data sets from Center for Medicaid Services. We might get um, CHIA data from you know, state governments like um, California. We may get payers claims data from um, Blue Prosper Shill, but yet have to go through a third party group like Corel, Corel, like just things like that. Like it's not always obvious what the process is and the steps along the way. And maybe like a cheat sheet that we would create um, across various different data providers, you know, that are common data sets that a lot of researchers are trying to gain access to. I can 
outside of the healthcare space, it would be um, like BLS or census data. Um, so most researchers don't, they don't know what the process is. And then our research administration offices mostly don't, like if it's a new data set or something, they don't know what that process is. And so I think a lot of times it's thrown back, a lot of it's thrown back onto the research computing staff and IT to like figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, very true. Yeah. So maybe a collection of things like that would be also really useful. Yep. So it's not telling people like how to build something, but it's telling them like what to expect um, on that process. And it might help us inform like <clears throat> better who should be involved on in our campus throughout that process. Well, and actually the, the I think the, the important goal to try and achieve there, can we as a community convince all these various demanders for documentation mm -hmm. to accept like one thing that we've already created that's already comprehensive rather than having to fill out each and every one of their little customized documents, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because that takes a massive amount of effort. Yes, that's, a, that's another nice goal to have. <laughs> I agree with that. Thank you. Yeah, I like that when I was trying to figure out who specifically would be the target audience of that type of um, the how to use the data sets and is that the contracts type of office or is this well it would be it would be a combination of them like the contracts office would know you know if it's this data provider these are the these are kind of the steps you have to go through we can provide it to researchers up front as a resource like this is about this is the journey you're about to go on to to require to get that data set gotcha um, yeah and it changes depending on kind of the data provider you know yes. are you are you getting an amendment to your you know cms data well that's that's very different than you've never had access to it and you're putting it on a system that doesn't have a record of, you know yet i think that's something huge where i yeah. mean the smaller institutions who don't have the ability of okay now i have to figure out your process and your process and yeah. yes we're, we're now chalking huge time sink on that one yeah, and then the other thing that happens is that you end up with different research domains going after compliant data sets. And because they're coming from a different part of the university, like maybe it's a data set that med school uses all the time and they have the process really ironed out. But if it's somebody say coming from social science or business that wants access to a data set that has to do with healthcare because they have a different angle at it, they don't know the process at all so that's that's the other aspect is it, it creates kind of a, a uniform understanding of the steps required and they don't have to be detailed right it just is something mm -hmm. of you know like in the case for cms you're gonna you don't go to cms you go to resdac right and you engage i mean just some simple things like that and like mm -hmm. these these are the people you engage with and this is how you these are the steps you're about to go through so we've got a comment here. Um, it's not all that different from HECVAT in that it allows us as a group to answer consistently without having each institution having to answer the same questions repeatedly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we are we are at the top of the hour, so I think we're probably going to lose a lot of our attend attendees, yep. but if there's someone who has you know, one outstanding question or comment, we can hopefully stick around for a few more minutes um, if you two are available. So we'll, we'll just hold on for one more moment before we wrap things up. <laughs> Okay, well, again, I wanna say thank you so much, Carolyn and Eric for joining us today. Um, if you, those of you in the audience want to share this presentation, I will be posting it later this, this afternoon to our website and to our mailing list. And with that, um, everybody have a great day. When I hit end, you'll be um, taken off the call, but again, thank you so much for presenting. Yep, have a great rest of the day. All right, bye everybody. Bye.